So I will start with an introduction to the solar cycle. Um, what you see here is the smoothed sunspot number during the last 400 years. Uh, and you can see, you're probably familiar with it, but let me just go to the basic central pub things. There are alternatives peaking solar activity, which we call maxima followed by quiet periods minima. And we have a very clear modulation of about, with a mean period of 11 years, the short, but there is a variation, right? The shortest cycle is about nine years, and the longest cycle is about 15. There is a, there is a, also a long-term, what seems to be like a long-term modulation. You don't have a completely random uh, accumulation of amplitudes between one cycle and the next. Sometimes you have cycles together that are, that are um, weak and cycles together that are strong. And there is this period here that is of great interest to us where there were very few sunspots observed in the sun, even though people were looking at the sun. That is called the Maunder Minimum. Now, when we think about the solar cycle now as a magnetic phenomenon, the main characteristics of the solar cycle are associated with what I'm going to talk call from now on as magnetic regions. But are this, and by this I mean this bipolar magnetic structures that you see in the surface of the sun. And they, there are many things that, that they have, there are several systematic properties that they have in common. One of them is a, a polarity orientation. So you can see here uh, what you're looking at is a magnetogram. Positive is uh, yellow going towards you and negative is blue going into the screen. You can see that in the northern hemisphere, you have positive, negative, positive, negative, positive, negative, positive, negative. So there is, an, there is a systematic east-west orientation. There are exceptions, but most active regions follow this rule. Now, across the, across the equator, there is a reversal of polarity. So now you have negative, positive, negative, positive, negative, positive, and so on. There is also another very, very important property that I'm going to mention several times during this talk, which is their tilt. If you trace a line parallel to the equator and another one going through the centroid of flux of one polarity and the other one, you're going to see an angle that we call the tilt, active region tilt. That is, presents also a systematic, it's a systematic, there is a systematicity to it of all active regions in one hemisphere and during one cycle. And, or, and even across multiple cycles. Basically what you have is that the trailing polarity the one that follows the other one is closer to the poles in average than the one that is leading. These two properties, this polarity orientation that we call Hale's law and tilt, systematic tilt that we call Joyce law are very, very important when it comes to, to, to understand how the cycle works. Now, almost every signature that we see in, of the solar cycle associated with them because they are also the points of origin to a, to a lot of the events that drive space weather. And so the first thing that I'm going to do is, is show you this movie where you can see the main characteristics of the cycle from the point of view of active regions. So what I do, what happens here is a Carrington projection, in a sense a projection in, lat, in longitude. And as you let this time pass, you can see that their numbers increase and decrease with the cycle. And also you can see that the place where they appear, the latitudes where they appear, migrates towards the equator as the cycle progresses. And then there is this migration of flux towards the poles that you, you also see as these branches. And so these three properties of the solar cycle are, are, the most, uh, are, are among the most important things that the, when it comes to understanding the solar cycle magnetically. And this is beautifully captured in what we call the butterfly diagram. Basically, this was built taking each one of these frames of that movie that I show you, averaging them in longitude and stacking them in time. And so you can see the migration of active latitudes as the cycle progresses towards the equator. You can also see the changes in their numbers, right, with these periods where there are very few in the sun. You can see the reversal of polarity across the hemispheres that I mentioned. You can see this migration of flux towards the poles. And there is a reversal from cycle to cycle. 
So when we try to model the solar cycle, our models need to be able to reproduce all these characteristics. So now let me go into solar cycle prediction. Why do we want to predict the solar cycle? And the short answer is because it's much more than just sunspots or active regions. Highly energetic events are modulated by the solar cycle. So flares and CMEs are modulated by the cycle because they are associated with the appearance in the surface of the active regions. So what you have here is the monthly flare rate during the last 30 years. So you have three solar cycles worth of flares. Different colors correspond to flares of different strengths. This, the black is, it contains all flares, and then you get stronger and stronger. You get fewer and fewer events. But you can see the clear modulation by the solar cycle. Right now, flares affect our upper atmosphere, right? And they are also have the potential of triggering sympathetic CMEs, which are one of the causes of geomagnetic storms, right? And CMEs as well are modulated by the cycle. So you see here the sunspot, the smoothed sunspot number, the monthly sunspot number in black. And these crosses indicate the rate of CMEs per day during this last solar cycle. <clears throat> now, the radiative output of the sun is also modulated by the cycle. And this is particularly evident in, in strong parts of the spectrum. The, in the energetic part of the spectrum. Here are snapshots taken by SOHO on EUV um, during the entire solar cycle once per year. And you can clearly see how it's much more brighter at maximum than it is at, at minimum. And this happens at, at all levels in the spectrum. And you can even see some uh, modulation when you look at total solar irradiance. Solar wind properties also change with the cycle. So what you're looking at here is data taken by the Ulysses instrument. It's an, an instrument that went into a polar orbit around the sun to measure the properties of the solar wind in situ. As you go around this circle, you're going to be different moments in time, but also different latitudes in that orbit. The distance between the center, the distance from the center indicates the speed of the solar wind at that moment in, in that place. And the color indicates polarity. So, th so the color indicates whether the magnetic field was going into the sun or outwards, into the outward part outside of the heliosphere. Behind, you have what, what is a typical configuration of the solar corona and, and at solar minimum. So you have these streamers here. And so you see there is a very clear distribution of fast solar wind above the polar, the polar crowns and slow solar wind at, at, at uh, equatorial latitudes. And here is the sunspot number during that orbit. So this is as Ulysses goes around, the cycle goes like this. Now if you look at this in maximum, it's a very different picture. Now there is a mixture of both fast and slow solar wind and polarity orientation. And behind, you have a corona that is much more complex and, and interesting. And then when you go to the solar minimum, you recover a configuration more like this one than like this one. Now there is a reversal of the polar field of the, of the orientation, as you can see. But you again have the fast, slow, fast kind of thing. And this, in turn, is important because you also, this modulates the amount of cosmic, the, the cosmic ray flux here on Earth, as seen here from Earth. The idea is when the magnetic field is very complex, the cosmic rays that enter the heliosphere interact with it as, a, as if they were collision kernels, because a lot of those cosmic rays are charged particles. So they will interact with the kernel and then get scattered into a different direction. So the net effect that that has is a, is a slower process of, a process of diffusion of these cosmic rays as they get near the Earth. And so at maximum, where you have the most complex magnetic field in the sun and the heliosphere, you have the lowest rates of CMEs, of, of cosmic rays. And at minimum, where the, where the heliospheric field is as, it's, as it's most simple, you have uh, the highest amount of cosmic ray flux. 
So you can see this modulation very clearly. It's weaker and weaker the harder the, as you go into higher and higher energy cosmic rays. Um, but you can see that it's, it's about a, a factor of 25%. Okay, so predictions exist, but the results vary widely. And this is a, an image that I'm showing you for effect. This is a compilation of all the predictions that were made for Solar Cycle 24. Okay, there are different methods of making your predictions. All of them are calculated here. S whether they are outlandish or not, these were all the predictions that we had, right? Now the range of predictions for Cycle 24 spans the entire range of all sunspot cy cycles directly observed. Okay, so all those 400 years of observations that I show you. And even though a lot of these are kind of off-the-wall predictions, classified by which kind of predictions are there, you have that every methodology has points at, at the entire range, okay? Now, not all predictions are equal. And what I'm going to, to show you is my, my belief that some are right for the right reasons. So we're right now at solar maximum. Uh, I, I believe the, the, the cycle is now entering a decay phase. So we're not going to see a, a return later or anything. It's just now. And this means that the predictions that were on this end for a very weak solar cycle 24 are going to be correct. Okay. And in particular, the ones that I'm going to focus on in this moment are predictions based on the solar polar fields. So let me explain how they work by explaining you very briefly our understanding of the cycle. We see the cycle in a very simplified manner as a process that takes the magnetic field, the solar magnetic field from a configuration that is mainly poloidal, so that is containing the R and theta plane, to another one that is toroidal, wrapped around the axis of rotation, and back. The first part of this process is driven by differential rotation. So here is, as an illustration, you have this poloidal structure, magnetic field, more like a dipole, embedded in, in, in a sun that rotates faster at the equator and slower at the poles. Since the plasma and the magnetic field are frozen, so they move together, what happens is that with time, this part is going to get ahead and this one is going to lag behind, wrapping the field around the axis of rotation. Now, there is a lot of input of energy here and this strengthens the magnetic field and, and creates these bundles from which we believe these active regions emerge. So once you have these strong bundles of field inside, these flux tubes emerge from the bottom of the convection zone towards the surface. The place where these bundles pierce the surface is where you see these bipolar structures of positive and negative. Okay? Now, so. In a sense, we believe that sunspots and active regions are an indicator, a proxy, of this toroidal field. Now, to go and close the cycle, several theories have been proposed, but the one that I'm going to concentrate today on is that what closes the cycle is the emergence and decay of these tilted active regions. So remember that I show you this magnetogram, and if I simplify it to do something like this, where each one of this has like a signature that looks like this. There is a systematic polarity orientation that I mentioned from east to west, and there is also a systematic tilt that has one polarity closer to the pole and the other one closer to the equator. Now, each one of these active regions carries as a north-south component. If you look at the northern hemisphere, it's going to go from south to north. But due to the fact that across the equator you have a reversal, in the south, you also are going to have the, 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 the north-south component is going to be from south to north. So the, that component of each one of these creatures, it's always pointing south to north most of, the, most of the time within a cycle. Each one of them contributes with a grain of sand to form a large scale. After you have 3,000 of them, you end up reconstructing this large scale field from which the cycle can start again. Now, when you say, okay, so let's use the polar fields to predict the cycle, the, reason, the reasoning is the following. We, know, we believe that poloidal field gets amplified by differential rotation to create toroidal field. This process is a linear process. Shear is a, is, a, is a linear process, right? And I told you, 
under our current understanding, sunspots and active regions are an indicator of this toroidal proxy. So the idea is, if you have a proxy for the poloidal uh, field, then they should be related. There, sh there should be a, a delay between them, and they should be linearly correlated. And this proxy is the polar fields, at minimum at least. Now, why, although this falls beautifully with our understanding, why wasn't this the method of choice? And there are several reasons. There is one special reason, that we only have 40 years of magnetic data, so that's only three data points. And to make things worse, the last three solar cycles, by that I mean 21, 22, and 23, were fairly of the same amplitude in the grand scheme of things. So you don't know if you're getting it right again and again just because things don't change or because uh, there is re reality in, in this relationship. But this cycle 24 is actually what shows you that this relationship holds because this cycle is very different than the other ones. So what, what we did was a consolidation of a proxy that, that spans 100 years and 10 cycles to look at this relationship. And it works like this. We use polar faculae. Faculae are bright photos photospheric patches which are, which, which are brighter than the surrounding quiet sun. And as sunspots are proxies for the places where you have very strong magnetic fields, faculae are also of a signature or of mid-strength fields that are not strong enough to suppress heat transfer and create these cool, dark regions. But actually what they do is depress the surface and enhance uh, the, the, your visible signature to appear as bright patches. So here's a highly processed uh, images, image showing you this, the sunspot and the bright network. They're much easier to see on the edge, which makes them ideal for what we want to do with them. And it's basically like this. When the magnetic fields are not strong enough to make these sunspots, they kind of concentrate in the, in the intergranular lanes. So you have magnetic field here that is in the place where you have downflows, and here surrounded by places where you have hot upflows, cool downflows and hot upflows. Now, it, the magnetic field is enough to create a depression that allows you to see deeper into the convection zone to, to a region that is slightly warmer and denser. So when you look at the thing edge on, it looks bright. So when, and in, in, in the fact that when you look at it obliquely is more visible, it, it's ideal to make, to look, see it at the poles. And it so happens that the fields at the poles have the right strength to, to create these kind of things. So we calibrated a century of Mount Wilson mafacular observation using magnetic data from Wil, uh, Wilcox Solar Observatory and MDI. And I'm just going to show you the result. So here is sans smoothed sunspot area during for, uh, measured by using uh, the Royal Greenwich Observatory. And here is an estimation of what the polar flux was during the last 100 years using the polar faculty. And now what, what the, the nice thing is now, instead of having just three cycles to look at this relationship, you have 10. And then you can look at this in detail. OK? So when we look at the relationship between the polar fields and the strength of the cycle, what we find is a very clear linear relationship that is what you expect from amplification by differential rotation. And you also find a secondary, relation, secondary branch populated by irregular and multimodal cycles. So let me show you. Here is again our two proxies. This is toroidal proxy, and this is poloidal proxy. Polar flux and sunspot area. Oh, and let me first really quickly. What you're looking at this in this plot is the polar flux at minimum versus the amplitude of the next cycle. OK? Now, the, 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 this is a hemispheric relationship. The blue and red are north and southern hemispheres. The, the green and purple are also uh, north and southern hemispheres. Okay? I just color them to discriminate between branches. But you're looking at here at this correlation from a hemispherical point of view. And when you look at the place, at the, at the cycles where that have an off branch hemisphere, what you see is that they are these irregular, have these irregular shapes, multimodal, right? Not this 
peaked, nice peak that reach a, a maximum and then have a decay phase. And so what we find is that they are, these are also preceded by strong asymmetries in the polar flux at minimum, right? And the way we read all this is by saying, OK, in these cycles where there is a strong asymmetry between the northern and southern hemisphere in terms of polar flux, not time, just polar flux, there is a significant amount of, of non-dipolar moments. So there is going to be more complex magnetic field inside the sun. And when it gets wrapped down together, you have conflicting branches of toroidal field that cancel out. So what this cycle will have a potential amplitude that is peaked like this, the fact that it conflicts with itself makes it so that it's chopped and it, it's basically in, an under, in, a, in, a, in a branch underneath. Now, this, what we find is we can predict when we are going to have an exception based on polar flux at minimum as well. So using polar flux at minimum, you can predict most cycles that, that fall in this branch, but you can also predict the except, most of the exceptions that fall on the other branch. And when you adjust for this, you find that you have a, a, a very nice relationship between predicted amplitude using this these correlations and observed amplitude in the, in the, of the next cycle. Okay? Now, <clears throat> all this analysis was, in a sense, I did it more with the objective of, as a proof of concept, that predicting the solar cycle with the, with the polar flux is possible. But this is done using ideal conditions. You know where solar cycle minimum is. You know when it's happening, everything. Now, the last thing that I did was look at how this performs if you don't know when solar minimum is. What happens if you use this relationship at solar minimum one year before minimum, two, three, four, and five years before minimum? And what, what I find is that as long as you use this relationship within two years of solar minimum, wherever that may be, you have to guess. But as soon as you do it within two years of solar minimum, you're going to be quite successful at guessing the amplitude of the next cycle. So. <clears throat> Precursor predictions are, are based on polar fields are highly successful. They must be used within two years of solar minimum. So now let's go into model-based predictions. By model-based predictions, I mean a prediction that uses a simulation. You use observations. You fit them to a model of what you think, how the solar cycle works. You advance your simulation, and then you use that to make your guess. Okay? This was the first time ever that a prediction, predictions using a model, models were used for solar cycle 24. And they're interesting because it's no longer a guess which quantity is the best one to make your prediction. Now it is also a test of your model. Is my model correct, right? So these predictions teach you, and that's one of the things that I like the best about them. Now, both of them were based on the kinematic dynamo. So this is a model of the solar cycle that is a simplif simplified model where the evolution of the magnetic field is prescribed by flow fields and a process of diffusion. Right? Flow fields are generally broken into a large scale fields that include differential rotation and a meridional flow. Small scale fields are, are modeled using this diffusivity and enhanced turbulent diffusivity. And you all have to prescribe some recipe for bringing flux from the bottom of the convection zone towards the surface and make active regions. Okay? Now, this is such uh, typically, until now, they, they were done in two dimensions. So they were axisymmetric. And this is uh, just an example of what one of them looks like. So this is the, the poloidal field in the, in the meridional plane. And this is the butterfly diagram that tries to, to, to be like the one that I showed you. Okay. There were two dynamo-based predictions. One by Chodhuri and collaborators that predicted a weaker solar cycle, 23 than 24. One by Dikpati and collaborators that predicted a, a stronger solar cycle, 23 than 24. And what I, wa what I wanted to do is look at why, why the difference between these two predictions, but from an observational point of view. 
So the first important difference is the nature of flux transport. This is something that is well known. People know about it. One hand, one, in, in the model of Chuhuri and collaborators, you have a, a model where diffusion, transport by diffusion is very important. In the other one, large scale flows are very important to determine the properties of your, of your flux transport. Now, the, 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 the reason why is this important is because a diffusive model has a short term, short -term memory. In a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a in a less diffusive model has a longer term memory, right? And this was studied by introducing randomness into the simulations by Yeats, Nandi, and McKay. So the results are the following: If you make a correlation between the amplitude of the, the of the poloidal field at minimum and the amplitude of the next cycle, the amplitude of two cycles later, the amplitude of three cycles later and the amplitude of the current cycle, then you find these kind of correlations. The only strong one that you find is this one. Basically, an, a correlation between the amplitude of this, the, of the polar or poloidal field at this minimum, and the amplitude of the next cycle. When you have a model that is less diffusive, correlation propagates farther back in time. So now several cycles are playing a role at determining how strong the next cycle is going to be. Now, since I now have more data points that we used to have before, I can look at this from the point of view of observations. And now I can show you the, the polar flux at minimum versus the amplitude of the next cycle, the amplitude of two cycles later, and the amplitude of three cycles later. And so you can see that the, cons the cons observations are consistent with a short-term memory regime. There may be other things that, that are shortening the memory of the solar cycle, but I read it as, as a suggestion that turbulent flux transport is actually very important. So this may be one of the reasons why one prediction was correct and the other one was not. But there is actually a more important point that I would like to make today that is not given a, a lot of imp, um, a, a prominence in these discussions, and is the way solar, da solar data was assimilated into these models. Remember the loop that I show you, poloidal to toroidal through differential rotation, and toroidal to poloidal to emergence and decay of tilted active regions. This is our predictive target, sunspot number. I already showed you that if we know the poloidal field, we can now guess it, right? Now, the model of Dikpatian collaborators fed data into their model here in this part of the loop. They use sunspot area as a proxy for how much flux do you have in the surface of the sun, fed it into their models here, and then let their model create based on that poloidal field that then it is amplified by differential rotation. Whereas Chodhurian collaborators, yes, yes. Well, in, it depends. Now it's changing because we're seeing different things. In the, in the past, we were using a single cell meridional flow. But now that observations are, are being able to see that that's not the case, then we need to use that. You can tune a lot of things because you, you could tune a lot of things before because you didn't have a lot of constraints. But now that we have more constraints, we have less parameters to tune. OK, but this is very important, actually. The fact that Chodhuri and collaborators put their data here, because they are waiting until the minimum to feed data into their model to create the toroidal field out of their simulation. But by this moment, you already know what the next cycle is going to be. Okay? But anyway, let me show you another reason why maybe that this model didn't get the thing correctly. And it's this. When you look at polar fields, on one hand, you have polar fields at the seed of the next cycle. On the other hand, you have a longer track path. You have sunspot area as the source of polar fields that is the source of your, of your next cycle. This relationship I already show you. Amplitude of uh, no, polar, polar flux at minimum, amplitude of the next cycle. Nice, beautiful correlation. But when you look at the other part of the path, which is amplitude of a cycle, 
versus the polar flux at the end of that cycle, you find no correlation. And this is because what closes the cycle is tilted active regions. And I think that was one of the things that was missing in this, in this prediction. It's not, a, it's not enough to have information about flux. You also need to have information about tilt. So if I show you now the amplitude of a cycle times the average tilt during that cycle, you recover the correlation between this quantity and the polar flux at minimum. And so now you have here what I see as observational evidence that our picture of the cycle is correct. Because you have a correlation between polar flux at minimum and the amplitude of the next cycle. And then you have a correlation of flux and tilt with the polar flux at minimum. So when you go back to dynamo-based predictions of this, for this cycle, sure, you have a prediction that was incorrect. Likely because there was an incorrect flux transport regime and because it was incomplete data assimilation. But you have a prediction that does no better than a simple linear precursor model. Okay? So <clears throat> there is a very, very nice Russian expression. That is that the first pancake, it's always lumpy. And I think that the, the value of these things is not, in the end, who was right and who was wrong, but which one taught us more and which one taught us less. And I think that that, that, that that was very important for the prediction that was made here in HAO. That was a very important thing. Because it was the most ambitious one. It was the one that went the farthest back in time. I think it had the right idea. But it was incomplete because it was the first time that you did it, right? So it's OK. Next time, we'll do it better. But I, I can tell you right here and right now that the next generation is going to be more like that one than like the other one. But of course, in order to outperform pre precursor methods, we need predictions before solar minimum. And that's very important. That's where the data simulation comes in. Turbulent mechanisms for transport need to and will be, be a fundamental part of the next generation models. I don't go into detail a lot about this right now, but regional flow measurements are showing that it's a really messed up thing. And a model that, it, that whose whole functioning hinges on the regional flow is going to be completely messed up by this as well. If you shift your paradigm for a more turbulent dynamo, then you can get away from this problem. And, I, and that's, so what I think is going to happen in this decade is that, that the response to the observations of meridional flow are going to be into turbulent models. But the other thing that I take from this as a lesson is understanding how active regions close the cycle is of paramount importance if we want to drive simulations to make predictions. So this comes to the last part of my, of my talk. What is the connection between what we see at the surface and the internal large-scale magnetic field? And this introduces a new generation of three-dimensional dynamo models. Okay? The technical challenges are the following. You need hundreds of flux tube eruptions within a single solar cycle. You need your whole convection zone as a computational domain. And of course, flux tube emergence is a three-dimensional process. So you no longer can use the simple axisymmetric models. But I think the choice, our choice, was to keep within the kinematic framework. Because it's the best compromise between complexity and cost, right? You cannot make yet a full MHD simulation that can be used for solar cycle predictions. So three, kinematic dynamo is the second best. And it has one of its weaknesses and its strengths is the amount of control you have. So if you can use it to your advantage to really constrain things, you're really going to work. Uh, for a better. Now, the way Activision was done in the past for kinematic dynamos was through the position. So you basically have axisymmetric rings of polarity deposited near the surface. So remember these three-dimensional structures in an axisymmetric simulation, the best you can do is something like that. It has a signature that looks like this. It's a signature where you have this clear, nice, dipolar structure at the surface, right? And you have this underlying field below. And, the, and a 3D version has been recently implemented by Mark and Maosumi. 
But I was going to, one of the things that I want to say here is that this is, may not be the best way of implementing active regions in a three-dimensional context. And let me tell you why. By using an implementation like this, you have to assume what the magnetic field underneath is. And that is a big problem because you don't know, you don't know anything about it, right? And there are also problems. They represent an artificial source of magnetic energy and flux, unrelated with any other aspects of your simulation. So you, can, you, you will always wonder whether the cycle works or not because you are depositing flux at the surface or because, or because it really the active region emergence and decay is important for a part of the process. And of course, it's heavily surface oriented. There is no connection between the surface and the interior. So it's very strongly shifted towards the surface. But if you compare with simulations, detailed simulations of flux to emergence, what you see is a different picture. Whereas these kind of creatures that have a poloidal signature that is very strong near the surface, when you look at any kind of simulations, be they thin flux to simulations, Anelastic simulations without turbulence, anelastic simulations with turbulence, and full MHD simulations of convection where you have buoyant flux tubes. You always have this a cross section that is narrower near the apex and, and thicker near the bottom of the convection zone. So what we did is, well, we have a kinematic dynamo. So we have that power of driving flux through flows. And so what we did is, in our simulation, we introduced these bubbles that have three components, velocity bubbles. One is radial that takes flux outward into the, into the, out, outward towards the fourth sphere. One is expands to account for the fact that you go from low to high density. And the other one rotates so that you impart regions, the tilt that you see with observations. And these are two sim isolated uh, eruptions in a simulation. So this is not just for, for show, just not for illustration, but it's actually the actual magnetic field in our simulations in a blank, in an empty sun, where all you have is a, a sheath of toroidal field at the bottom of the convection zone. And we can control with a very high degree of precision the properties, some of the properties of the resulting active regions, position, size, and tilt. So what we did is we use active region data taken from solids to blow holes through a sheet of toroidal field at the bottom of the convection zone in a way that matches the time, position, and tilt of observed active regions. And so what you're looking at here is where those bubbles are and a butterfly diagram of the toroidal magnetic field in the bottom of the convection zone. So you can already see how the belt that will yield the next batch for the next cycle has been created self-consistently by that model. Here is the surface magnetic field, the butterfly diagram of that surface magnetic field. And it's very nice because with that minimal set of assumptions, just a flow that takes flux, flux up, we can study the interaction between active regions as they rise during the cycle and that connection between the surface and the interior. So here you're looking at two snapshots during that simulation. One, um, just when the simulation is starting, everything looks more like solar minimum. Here are toroidal, uh, this is, this is a, sorry, poloidal field. This is a contour, three-dimensional contour plot of the poloidal field. This is a three-dimensional contour plot of the toroidal field. Here is the surface magnetogram associated with that simulation. And here is a coronal field extrapolation. Now, in a more active phase of the cycle, now you start wrapping the things around. You can see making the belts. You also have way more complexity in the form things interact. And you have a magnetogram that looks much more to what we have at the sun. In the sun. And a coronal field extrapolation also. And this is very nice because that means that we can couple this simulation naturally to heliospheric models. So, and we have done so coronal and solar wind models right now, we're doing it. We also can quantitatively compare our, the result of our simulation with observations. And the, the quantity that we, well, we're, this is, we have, we know, 
we're only starting to figure out which quantities are the most relevant ones. But in this work, the ones that we compared was total and observed, observed and unsigned clocks at the surface. Um, so you have, so you have them here, and this is the correlation. So I think that just by blowing holes like this, we're being able to get the necessary amount of flux in the surface. And then now that we, we have this link between our simulation and observations, we look at surface and interior. And here is the important thing. The babco layton mechanism, active vision emergence and decay, has always believed to be a surface phenomenon. And this is more than anything a historical inertia. The first person that came up with the idea, Babco and Layton, thought that the entire solar cycle was taking place in near surface layers. And later, when people started making surface flux transport simulations and demonstrated that active region emergence and, and decay can reverse the polar fields in a way that we see in observations, then it stuck in our head that everything was taking place near the surface. But now, we believe that the dynamo is not taking place near the surface, at least not the amplification and storage of the toroidal field. Boy, the, these toroidal bundles are stored at the bottom, and they rise at the surface in the form of flux tubes. So my question is, is this picture of a separation of layers true, based on now these assumptions that I'm using? And it's very convenient, because when you have this separation, you introduce delays that make your cycle robust. And if you connect them with meridional flow, then you can obtain beautiful, beautiful solutions. So what you're looking at here is poloidal energy inside the convection zone in black. And then in the top third here in red, the mid third in a solid purple line and the bottom third in a solid blue line. And so what we find is that only 7% of the total poloidal energy is contained in the top third of the convection zone. So that means that the seat of this inter exchange between poloidal and toroidal fields from the poloidal aspect is also taking place in the interior, not at the surface as is normally thought to be. So we say, OK, if, if this is the case, then why surface proxies are so good? Why do we see this relationship between poroidal and toroidal proxies that are, we can only see them at the surface? And so what we do is we compare the unsigned surface flux that we see in our simulation with the poroidal energy inside the convection zone. So what we find is that they are very nicely correlated. Of course, this is a simplified simulation. In the real sun, this is not going to be as beautiful. But our idea is this. The fact that you're, blo that you're bringing flux, this internal component of the flux tubes, the ones that you never see at the surface, it's, it's, it's connecting everything all the way through. So that's why we can use, at least at specific points during the cycle, the surface to infer what's going on underneath and make these kinds of predictions. So my concluding remarks are, Precursor predictions have, oh my goodness, oh yeah. For a moment I thought I had the wrong slide. So let me change the order I was going to tell you. Precursor predictions have reached their full potential. Model-based predictions are in their infancy. So I think that we're doing as, as good as we can do with precursor methods. Even the most direct proxy that we have, which is polar flux, works only for two years before the minimum. And you don't need to do geomagnetic precursors anymore. We have the observations of the polar flux, right? This was before when we didn't. But now, from now on, we will have them. And of course, like I, like I told you, the cycle amplitude can be predicted using solar minimum conditions. Observations suggest, and this is also, I think, a very important result of, of this uh, study. Active regions are the link that we think them to be. Okay? So, so when we want to make long-term predictions, our task is to try to guess, as best as we can, the overall properties of, of active region during an effluent cycle, tilts and flux. Now, taking advantage of a kinematic formulation, we have introduced a new way of modeling flux tube emergence that captures the best of 
very detailed simulations of flux of emergence, like thin flux of simulations and so on and so forth. But we can use it to assimilate observations and drive a kinematic model using those, right? So, so, so I think that the model is, has a lot of promise. Now what we need is very good data, right, to drive the model so we can start making the iteration between good data with the model compared to observations, find that everything is wrong and try to figure out what is right and so on and so forth. And we find the source phase to contain but a fraction of the poloidal energy, but it's in strongly correlation with the internal energy. So the surface, now I believe, this is my personal belief and speculation based on the simulations. The surface is not the seat of the, of, of the dynamo, but it's, it's a window into it, right? So that's all that I wanted to tell you today. Thank you very much for your attention. Questions for Andres? Um, in your three-dimensional kinematic dynamo model, so you based on observation of emerging regions, and then whenever you see an emerging region, you blow one of these tornadoes up. And then, will, so the, the only, that's the only source of poloidal field, basically. So yes. are you able to sustain cycles, for example? I Self-sustaining, are, are, are you getting cycles in that way? So we haven't, in, in part because I think I, I, I have put in a little bit of hold that part because I really need to understand the statistical properties of, of active regions before I blow those holes in a meaningful way. What we have done is blow holes again and again and again using observations, but putting them on top of the toroidal belts that we have seen in our simulation. So, and what we find is that there is enough. Yeah, there is, there is plenty of flux actually there. So just if you have a, a certain amount of active regions that emerge, in fact, these are, uh, in, that emerge, and their properties are inconsistency with observations, then this will be enough to drive the cycle. So what, we, what you see here is that. So, so what I was showing you before was this part of the simulation. Now what we did is we put the same set with a delay and blow the holes all over again. But of course, we, we reversed the, 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 in, the thing so that you have different tilts and the, the, so you follow the, the changes with the cycle. And then you blow the next set again, and you blow the next set again. And, and if you just do it and do and do, it just goes on. So, so what we're working on right now is how to really nail down when and where and what are the properties of the active regions that will appear. But yeah, there is plenty of flux. You don't need any external source. It doesn't mean there isn't, but it's enough. Dynamo models, which, which are mostly based on the babcock layton IFR effect, they have very often the problem that you need a too strong polar field to make the dynamo actually work, since you kind of you lose almost a factor of 1,000 from the process you dump the flux in active region to what is a flux at the poles. But then differential rotation can, over 11 years, only amplify this by a factor of 50. So you kind of have to make the part which converts active regions with tilt ang angle into a polar flux much more efficient than it is on the sun to actually make it work. How does this look like in your model? So I, this is one of the biggest problems that I had with my 2 and a half d And I think that the reason how this works in this one is because now you have a three-dimensional thing. So before, there were two problems with the two-dimensional uh, addition of active regions. One is, as I told you, was a very surface concentrated thing. So now the poloidal signature is all the way through the convection zone, and the and the legs actually contribute quite a bit of poloidal field to the whole system. But additionally, you can have multiple emergences out of the same toroidal belt, which wasn't possible in an axisymmetric simulation. So you can multiply by a factor of n, right? How many bubbles can you blow out of a sheath of toroidal field 
gets multiplied by the fact that you now have 360 degrees extra of, 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 of space. And so I think these two things together work so that, so that it's not necessary anymore to have the, in fact, the polar fields that you're looking at here are, much, are matching observations. This is Gauss. This is saturated to five Gauss, right? But the ones that you have in the bottom of the convection zone in this simulation are 5,000 Gauss. So it's sufficient. By going into 3D, you fix that problem. Uh, so now there is no, no problem there anymore. So if I understand correctly, you're assimilating data just by putting in a flow to, to move flux to the surface. Is mm -hmm. that right? So how does the dynamo saturate? Because if you're not controlling the amount, the flux budget. It doesn't. It, it doesn't what, grow? I mean, we have not done 100 years worth of simulation. But we do see, and you can see it here, how it gets stronger and stronger. So, so yeah, that's, that's, that's also another. Actually, yeah, the problem is not lack. It, the problem is going to be too much. So I don't know. We're, we're, we're thinking about using much higher diffusion. We want to try a, a, like a mixing length level of diffusion, which is orders of magnitude, two orders of magnitude above what we are using in this one here, to see how everything looks like when you use this kind of, of diffusion. But I guess the point is, if you're using a kinematic approach and you're just specifying the velocity field, then either it's supercritical dynamo or it's not. So either it's going to, if you're just playing with the flow field, then either it's going to grow exponentially or decay. So my, 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 my feeling is that the, what I want to see is whether the quenching is on the active region stilt. So, so that's why I'm, I'm, I'm revisiting all the work that people did in the 90s on, on active region properties and see, because that could be if, as you get stronger, your active regions become less tilted, then their contribution is less. So that's, that's the mechanism that I'm thinking may be what prevents the thing from going super critical to infinity. But this is not, this is just what, I, what I'm hoping will, will happen. But I, we haven't done it yet. I was just going to ask about the, the meridional circulation. You, comment, you, you briefly mentioned earlier the new observations and, and the idea that there, there are sometimes more than one cell or, or cells layered in radius. What are the implications of that for this kind of, um, these kinds of models? Um, and in particular, when you were looking at, when you were comparing the, the two different types of models and you were doing the, looking for correlations, linear correlations with n and n plus 1 cycles and all that, do you think having multiple cells will change that? Or, or, or have you looked at that at all? Yeah, so basically, when, you, when the most important thing for the transport of flux is the meridional flow, and you assume it is a single cell, a lot of the things that make your cycle work are built into the delay that that path creates. Right? This, is the, this is the concept of, that, is, that is called as the conveyor belt. If the conveyor belt goes fast, then you have shorter cycle if it goes slow. So in, though, in that delay, you build a lot of the properties of the system. If you break the cell into the, the meridional flow, instead of a single conveyor belt, a multiple broken and very messy thing, what you do is you short circuit this, these paths. And you reduce your time scales so much that the results look completely different. This has been shown using uh, axisymmetric dynamos. Now, when you have a very strong diffusion, that path is already circum circumvented in a way anyway. right? So now, a huge part of the delays that you use to make these connections and everything is taken up by the, the, the diffusivity. And when you build your model around it, it becomes more robust to changes in the meridional flow. So, so that's why I think what will happen now is that shift, right? Because if you use. And people now have starting to use other mechanisms of flux transport that are large scale, but are associated with the properties of turbulence. And that, that, that can shoulder part of the load that we're placing on meridional flow. So there is a net downward flow right, that helps s substitute this 
the part of the cell that was going down. And then there is a net equatorward component to that transport that can help you make your wings have the right shape and everything. And so when you add these mechanisms of flux transport, you're basically taking away importance from the original flow at deeper layers where it's weak and leaving it as it was at higher level, at, at certain near surface layers where it's strong. And so your surface flux transport is going to remain pretty much the same, but your internal flux transport becomes less reliant on the meridional flow, and that way you solve the, the problems. Uh, now, I don't know if it will be solved completely or not, but my guess, if I, as a modeler, right, need to respond to the new measurements of meridional flow, that's definitely the, the immediate thought is, you, is, is changing into those new mechanisms. Right? Modelers take advantage as much as they can of their freedom, right? Until observations force them not to. So, so, so now what I think will happen is full image dissimulations will, will be the next frontier there. These large scale things are going to, that constraint is going to come from, from the full image dissimulations. And, and so that's how it's, I think it's going to evolve during the next 10 years. In this moment, we're using a single cell. That's another problem that this model has. So we're using a single cell, low diffus relatively low diffusivity, not as low as some people, but relatively low. So what we're, what our next steps is ramping up diffusivity a lot, breaking up the meridional flow, and gradually try to see if we can shift the, the, the model operation into something compatible with what we have. Does the computation a cost of this sort of approach? How many core hours do you need per cycle? Not, 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 not very many. I mean, it's, it's, uh, I haven't really calculated it as such, but with, you, you probably are more, are faster than me to, with this math, but with 130 cores, we make 10 years in one day. So, so it's, it's still, in one week, you can have seven cycles, right? And so in one month, you can have, and, and so it, you reach the numbers necessary for this kind of approach. Uh, yeah. and, and I'm sure you could make a, a newer version which is more efficient. Our, ours is not, was not built with a huge emphasis on efficiency. It was more on the, on the, on the different properties of the things. So scientific methodology relies on falsifiability. And I was wondering if you have concerns about the falsifiability of this kind of modeling. Well, I think that one of the, my main motivations for working with this model is a practical approach, right? And once I have assembled the data and the model, the, that's, I mean, the, 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 to be able to do it or not is going to be what is going to falsify whether my approach was correct or whether, or whether there was some things that, that were not going to work out. So, so, so through the practical application to solar cycle prediction is where I expect what I'm hoping to find that wall, right? When I, when I say, okay, if I have this belt and I create this set of active regions, how does that compare with the cycle that we observe? Because the thing is, that's another thing that I think it's, it's nice in this new, at, in this attempt that we make. This is the first time, I, I can guarantee you, this is the first time that, you're going, that you have seen a plot like this, where you actually take an observable quantity and compare it, compare it, compare it with, a, with, a, with a measure, with a, with a product out of the simulation of a kinematic dynamo like ours, right? So it's no longer my wings look like the sun. Now the idea is to, to push it into a practical application where the things that I'm going to compare can be quantified. So how much flux do I have? What are the properties of the pills that I, that I have? Do my polar flux respond like the 100 years of measurements that I have? 
uh, can I, if I stop my simulate, if I simulate data for cycle 20, 21, 22, and then I make a fake set for cycle 23, does it work? Does it not? These, these are the, the points where, where this false viability is going to be. But I mean, if I, if I bring up the old theory of planetary orbits, you could do a beautiful job with epicycles of describing uh, the motions of planets. Right, but I mean... So the physics here you've got is, is there's a bunch of stuff that swept under the carpet. Diffusivity is one of them. Hmm? Um, kinematic approaches, it is what it is. Um, so my concern is that I see in what seems to be an agreement there. I don't know what... You had something input from the data, so you've got data simulation and data out, and it agrees. How would you know... What, when would you conclude that something's wrong from a graph like that? I mean, why, why would you expect to get something different? Well, I can tell you already by showing you this. I, mean, I presume you can fiddle with things like diffusivities to, and get any result you want, but... Um, but the, the, the idea is to push the detail up to a point where I cannot longer do it, right? Break the system by, by, by demanding so much of the simulation that I, con that I can no longer do it, right? Sure, I got the, 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 the total unsigned magnetic flux. So let's look at dipolar moment now, right? Let's look at the polar fields. Uh, let's look at average tilt during a cycle. Let's look at the amplitude of the cycle or the shape of the cycle itself. Let's look at active longitudes. Let's look at after, uh, sorry, not lo active longitudes, but latitudes. You push it, I mean, just keep pushing. I, I agree that these models are, uh, have uh, so much freedom that you can never really you can never really trust them, never. But if you keep pushing, you will break them. That's the point, right? I mean, and, and especially if you, what you want to do is a practical application. So sure, I did this, okay? So bring the next challenge, right? The, the, the next one and the next one and the next one. And at the same time, there, there is progress in other parts of solar cycle modeling. There is pro progress in flux tube simulation. There is progress in full MHD simulation. And I don't know if you know, but uh, the people at, the, um, at Montreal, at the University of, of Montreal, did a simulation where they extracted mean field parameters from a full MHD simulation and used them to drive a kinematic model and, and compare the solutions. And, and, and the, 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 the models compare remark, remark surprisingly well. And this, in this moment, for this simulation, all the constraints came from another simulation that is more detailed. So it's not, I, I can guarantee you that I can find, I just, there are millions of ways of breaking this model. It's just a matter of time and, and ingenuity. And, 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 I, and I guess for this kind of model, that's very important, and I agree. So it's just keep pushing it, keep pushing it, and keep pushing it. If, if it matches everything, then I'm sure there's going to be something that it doesn't match. There will always be, because it's, it's a simplified model. Well, no more questions? Let's thank uh, Andreas again for an excellent talk. Thank you.